that sort of ravaged this area, especially the one in January, but then compounded by the one in March. And this is sort of an opportunity, I figure, to obviously talk about some of the good things that took place subsequent to those storms, but also to hear where we still need to go, and also hear about how we can do better in regards to the type of response that not just the federal government, not just the state government, but the local government um, provided, especially considering what we are dealing with now when it comes to climate change and our knowledge, and I hate to say it like this, but the confidence that we're going to have another storm. We're going to have another extreme weather event. And we just wanted to, I felt this was appropriate to do, to just to be sure that obviously when we go forward, that um, we know what we've done right, what we've done wrong, and like I said, how we can improve. Now, I know that there were other areas in Santa Cruz County in the 19th Congressional District that got hit as well in January, including San Lorenzo Valley. That's why I did two town halls up there and continue to work with that community. And then come March, we also know that there are other parts of Santa Cruz County that got hard hit, like Pajaro County that is not in the 19th Congressional District, that's in the 18th Congressional District. And I will continue to work with Representative Zoe Lofgren in her leadership in ensuring that the federal government is present down there. But Capitola is in the 19th Congressional District. I proudly say it's in my district. And that's why we're here tonight, to talk about where we've been since January, where we are and where we're going. And it's an opportunity to be frank, like I said, to, to talk about the disaster relief, the ability to recover, the ability re to rebuild, but most importantly, our resiliency. Our resiliency, as I think is the key word, especially knowing 
what we're going to have to face. Now, that, Jan that January storm, I believe, tested us. The rain and the storm surge led to landmarks being destroyed, businesses being battered, and as we saw, homes absolutely being devastated, unfortunately. But we endured. And even as we dealt with the resulting disruptions in our daily lives, the power outages, the road closures, the damaged infrastructure, and then that other storm in March, we endured. However, we did that. We did that. And what we did during times like that is, I believe, is what this community, what Santa Cruz County does best. In the face of those types of challenges, people step forward, people step up, and they lean in to basically making sure that we get on the right track when it comes to recovery. You did it, the government did it at all levels because we wanted to make sure that the resources were there for, like I said, that immediate relief, that recovery, that rebuilding, and now on to making sure that we are resilient. Now at the federal level, I did my best to ensure that the federal government played its part. Obviously seeing the damage, knowing that it was going to meet the threshold of a natural uh, in a presidential disaster declaration and having dealt with numerous disasters on the central coast unfortunately just the nature literally the nature of where we're at um, i made sure to start lining our ducks up right away i have a relationship unfortunately or fortunately how you look at it with the FEMA director or the regional director who you've probably seen dealing with the Maui fires right now, a gentleman by the name of Bob Fenton, who I have his cell phone, reached out to him immediately. Reached out to Nancy Ward of Cal OES immediately. And after that, reached out to the White House immediately and let them know that that request is coming down the pike. Now because of that, we instantly got the federal emergency declaration. That's just the immediately, immediate declaration that allows local governments to get reimbursed by the immediate relief that they provide. Then we had to push for the Presidential Disaster Declaration. These are two separate declarations that get made. The Presidential Disaster Declaration is a little more difficult, but it means a little bit more, coming a lot more, coming into our community with SBA and FEMA as well. And so we worked with the city and the county for the assessments. I uh, had a great relationship with as busy as she was, drinking from a fire hose, the mayor coming into her <laughs> position and dealing with that right out of the chute, but did an excellent job, uh, at least with working with us and I believe working with all of you in regards to putting the, together that assessment. And then it was kind of then reversed order. Then we had to push it to OES of the state. The state then had to push it to the, the Region 9 Director of FEMA. The Region 9 Director of FEMA then had to push it to the Governor's Office. The Governor's Office then pushed it to the White House and basically we were able to get our disaster declaration. And I think by that push, that's why we are able to get the President's attention and we were fortunate to have him here. And the one thing I remember that stuck out to me with that visit was not that, that he was here, but what he said was that we not only are here now, we will remain here. And I think FEMA and the SBA have done a good job in not just being there for that immediate recovery, but also following up and continuing to be here when it comes to the claims, the numerous claims that we were there. Now, part of that push was the fact that I led a, the entire California delegation, that's 50 back then, it was 53 before, no, it was 52, 52 in January, 52 members of Congress and our two senators got on this letter letting the president know we need that disaster declaration, and we got it. We got it, uh, which was very, very good, and that's why we had FEMA and SBA here on the ground responding. Now, what we saw was the whole of a community effort. I think we can all sort of agree to that. Not just the federal government, not just the state government, definitely not just the local government, but all of you. All of you and the businesses that endured the, uh, the unfortunate damage that we saw uh, here in Capitola. And that's why we had the discovery recovery, excuse me, the recovery centers that we did. Now, when the storms hit this winter, we made a commitment to keep the pressure on the federal government uh, to stay engaged until we we're back on our feet. And eight, eight months later, we are continuing to keep the pressure on because I think all of us kind of understand the work isn't finished. We know we have more to do, and that's part of the reason for this meeting tonight. Now, as we were built. We don't just want to get back to where we were, like I said, but we want to be resilient to withstand the next storm. We just know, unfortunately, it's going to happen. Now, some of the major projects that we're focused on, we're going to hear about tonight, obviously, uh, is the Capitol Wharf. 
uh, Capitola Wharf, excuse me. And what I've come to realize and what you know is that it's not for tourists, but it's for us. That sentimental, that traditional value that it brings to Capitola, to those here in Santa Cruz, I think is very, very meaningful, and that's why you have the commitment, the commitment of all of us to rebuild that war, but also, but also to make it more resilient, like I said. And I think what you saw demonstrates how important it, us, it is to us. Obviously, we are able to get 3.5 million for the wharf uh, and then use it for the rebuilding. We had state funding, thanks to John Laird and our local assembly members. We had uh, the local Measure F, thanks to all of you. And we had local donations. The next project is Cliff Drive, obviously a key evacuation route. Uh, if, it, if, it, if, if it gets blocked off, and that's something that we want to continue to rebuild, make more resilient, and that we can protect this community from the next severe weather event. I'm continuing my efforts to secure federal funding, be it through the appropriations process, but also working with the Federal Highway Administration as well, and making sure that they step up. That's a continued push. And then the Stockton Bridge, sort of reinforced, not just the pilings, but obviously making it a little bit more resistant when it comes to debris that flows down, as we've seen over and over during those storms and those surges. And then, of course, we had the FEMA relief for various projects around Capitola, from removing debris, repainting the streets, replacing the fences, repairing the electrical, and reinforcing the bluffs as well. Close to 2.5 million in uh, retrofits that we need to undergo. Uh, and then we had FEMA relief for individuals in Santa Cruz County where we secured 1.5 million for them and then SBA support right here in Capitola. Just in Capitola alone, $1 million for home loans, business loans, and EIDL, economic injury disaster loans as well. So we got millions in federal funding for Capitola, for Santa Cruz County, for its residents, uh, residents and for our businesses. That's a lot, but a lot more can be done. And I think all of us understand that. And that is our commitment as we sit here, at least my commitment, I can tell you, as I sit here in front of you, in regards to what the federal government can and can do. Uh, I'm obviously proud of what happened in regards to the response, but I also know it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect. And that's where I can learn and we can get better. Because like I said, for that next storm that's coming down, and that's why we're here tonight to discuss not just the progress that has been made, but the work that lies ahead and how we can get better. Now joining me, I'm very, very honored to have a panel of leaders in our community who have been absolutely instrumental in not just the day-to-day -day governing, uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, operations of Capitola, uh, but have been instrumental in our road to recovery. And so what I'd like to do uh, before we open it up to all of you is to uh, go through, and I'll, I'll, I have the order in front of me, go through this list uh, and they're going to have, have, have them say a few comments about it as well. And obviously uh, the first person that I'd like to introduce to uh, say a few words and thank her for hosting us tonight and all of the service uh, that she really uh, demonstrates every single day. But leaning in, just absolutely leaning in. Uh, to that disaster that we all experienced, and that's the mayor of Capitola, Margo Kaiser. Thank you. Much appreciated. And Councilwoman Brooks will be on deck. Yes, okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I will keep it pretty brief, um, but I think uh, seeing everybody show up here tonight is really special and important, and it says a lot about Capitola and our community and, and their surrounding communities. Um, yeah, so I was mayor for about uh, a week, and then the storm hit, and it was a pretty remarkable experience. Uh, but I was so comforted by the fact that people from Mr. Panetta's office, Laird's office, um, I was getting phone calls, emails, checking in, what can we do, how can we show up, what do you guys need? And it just was a really uh, heartwarming experience to feel supported by those that are around us and our representatives. And um, along with FEMA and the SBA, um, Cal OES as well, um, like Mr. Panetta said, we sustained a lot of damage, $2.5 million, that's, that's huge, you know, and we've done a lot to... That's not including the war for Cliff Drive or anything Right, else. so these are the smaller projects, about 
probably 18 to 20 projects, I think, um, all around all around the city. And we're a tiny city, so that's kind of a lot uh, when you when you think about it. Um, but putting it out there, so many people have stepped up. Community, federal, business owners, everybody really rallied and came together, and it was um, something that, you know, I think we need to plan further ahead for these storms to either hit bigger, harder, stronger, sooner. You know, it's a, it's a pretty scary thought. But if we can be prepared, um, when President Biden was here, one of the main takeaways was, we'll build it back, but we'll build it back better. And I think that is the only way that we can really push forward and have confidence in doing so as, um, as a community and as other representatives that are here to help um, hold us up. Uh, there's been a lot of volunteer efforts, a lot of uh, a work um, on the fence up on Cliff Drive, or not Cliff Drive, Grand Avenue up on Depot Hill. That was all volunteer based. Um, a lot of business owners, a lot of community members came up for business, um, sorry, beach cleanup. Uh, business cleanup too, that happened for sure with all the debris and things like that. Um, so this is just a, a great opportunity for everybody to kind of see each other's faces um, in one tiny room. Sorry, it's so small. We could, probably could use the other room today, but um, I'm just really glad that everybody that is here is here. We will continue to work with Cal OES, FEMA. Uh, Senator Laird also helped get us lots of funding, but thank you so much to Mr. Panetta's office for, we already had a large portion of the work funded. Uh, this just uh, expedited a lot quicker than we anticipated. So I appreciate everybody's understanding. Uh, what I've learned by sitting in this seat is this stuff doesn't happen quickly, and, and there can be a lot of expectations put along um, local government, federal government, things like that, and it is a slow process. A lot of these things, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of I's dotted, T's crossed, it's pretty crazy. So just to keep that in mind as we're moving forward, um, we're going to continue to have some construction dust around town. Just be mindful. We are working, we are trying to get that wharf up and running. It's going to feel so good. Our groundbreaking is this month, the 22nd. Yeah! So, everybody get ready. It's going to be a process, but hang in there. We got this. We've already shown that Capitola can build back better. So, just stay along for the ride, and thank you guys so much for the support. Great. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. I, I, I got to say, um, Councilwoman Brooks has been, she, unfortunately for me, has my cell phone. <laughs> and she lights me up all the time when it comes to the issues of Capitol. But I got to tell you, uh, one of the big reasons that we were able to secure that $3.5 million was because of Councilmember Brooks. Uh, I cannot stress that enough. She reached out to me early on. She talked to me, talked me through, walked me out there, and basically explained to me how important this work is. And this was before the storm. And so if it wasn't for her dedication and commitment to this community, um, you know, I, I, can, I can attest that, 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 that I probably wouldn't be here. And so I really want to give my appreciation to her and give her time to uh, speak to you as well. So Councilwoman Brooks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thanks. And, and, uh, I know Councilwoman Peters, Peterson's here. She's back there. There's Kristen here. I'd, I'd like to, uh, I, I, I'd like to invite there's her to say a few words after uh, Councilwoman Brooks, if that's okay too. Um, you know, our work began in 2021 uh, when we started thinking about what we needed to do to complete our wharf project. It's been on the docket for years. We had plans. We knew about the, the certain things that just needed immediate assistance. And yes, just because I had his phone number, I, I called and said, hey, let's do something. And our congressman got right to work. And we were, I, I mean, when you get that call that something can be done, there's no, there's no way to describe how excited you are and how excited I was for our community because we knew that was going to happen. And I would say two months, right, up two months after the storm happened, and I said, oh no, Congressman, this is not enough money. We're going to need a lot more to get this project done. And um, about two to three days after our Congressman showed up for a tour, and this is when everything was still a mess. We had debris all over the beaches, five feet high, the waves were still really strong, and we took him out there um, next to the Venetian so he could see the, da the damage to assess it. And um, about a 
five foot rogue wave <laughs> came wow. over us. Yeah. Um, and I just thought to myself, oh no, if we kill the congressman, <laughs> <laughs> we are not going to see any of this money. <laughs> You know, back backs towards the water, which is not ever a good idea if you're a surfer here, you know, don't turn your back on the ocean. But we did because we didn't know what else to do, but we made it. And um, what was really inspiring, because everyone was already up to work cleaning up our community, I mean, a day into the, stor the storms being over, that community members came out, our congressman was there, shaking hands, talking to them, getting the stories from folks. And it just was a sight to be seen. So when we talk about a community effort, you know, when you can work with somebody at the federal level to to get uh, funds for your community, it is really something special. So I'm really grateful for your time here, Congressman, and I um, appreciate everyone that's um, that's here in attendance. Thank you. Thank I would love to give, uh, you know, have you say a few words based on your service and your commitment to this community as well sure. and the work that lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Kristen Brown, the Vice Mayor here in Capitola. Thank you so much, Congressman Panetta, for being here. We are so incredibly grateful for all the work that you have done for the city of Capitola. And of course, as the mayor mentioned, just really trial by fire in your first week as mayor to have to deal with this kind of crisis in our city. But I think it's truly a testament to the power of community that we had our member of Congress, our Senator John Laird, our assembly member, Don Addis. We had our supervisor, Zach Friend. We had our mayor, Margo Kaiser, everyone working together to try to bring um, some support to our community. And of course, our community members themselves who have stepped up, as mentioned, in volunteer efforts in uh, donations to enhance the wharf and not just rebuild it. Truly, community is what has gotten us this far and it's what it's gonna bring us as we move forward uh, through these, these repair and recovery efforts. So again, thank you so much, Congressman Panetta, for being here. It means so much to us. Thank you, Councilman Brown. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the city manager, I think, is still stuck in mud out in the desert of Nevada. Um, <laughs> but we're fortunate enough to have, uh, probably time him out a little bit. <laughs> But I'm fortunate enough to have the Public Works Director here. We're fortunate enough to have uh, Jessica Kahn here uh, to talk about the work that has been done and where we need to go. So, Jessica. Yes, yeah, she's on the Great. Oh, okay. Thank you. Please, uh, Jessica. Good evening. Thank you all and for being here. And then FEMA. Oh. FEMA. FEMA will be next. And thank you, uh, Congressman, for inviting me to speak this evening. As our council member said, we have about $2.5 million worth of damages, which is a lot for a really small city like this. It's spread over about 20 projects. Um, I have four professional staff, and so we are definitely still in recovery mode. Um, it has definitely been a group effort. Um, we've been very fortunate to have really good partners with PG&E and our Regional Transportation Commission to really help us get through some of these things that we really knocked out early on with our staff, getting all of our public access reopened or as much as we could immediately, but there's definitely still work to do. Uh, there's things that require a lot of permits, a lot of red tape, like Nurk Kaiser said, a lot of things that are seasonal, like on the creek, um, on Cliff Drive, that are just going to take a lot longer to repair and have the funds for and have the time to get to with our staff and contract staff. So we really appreciate this community's patience with us. We're trying to get through it as fast as we can. We appreciate all the volunteer efforts. This community is really resilient. Um, the name of the game for us now is resiliency. Uh, like we all know, our work project is getting started here in the next month or so. Um, not only is it doing the repairs to what happened during the storm, but it's making it wider, it's making it more resilient, it's making it less likely for this to happen again. Same thing, name of the game is resiliency with Cliff Drive and with our Stockton Bridge, just so when these events continue to happen that we are more prepared for them in the future. And we're really appreciative of uh, co the Congressman and Senator John Laird and all of our other partners really speaking for this community and getting us the funding we need to do these really large projects, because frankly, the staff on its own here, we don't have the resources of some other agencies to go out and go for those funds. Um, so we are just very appreciative of our electeds and of our community who keeps coming out and supporting us and like you all are this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just um, digress real quick. Um, as the 19th Congressional District, your 19th Congressional District, our 19th Congressional District, stretches all the way from South San Jose, Lake Cunningham, up over the hill, down in the Santa Cruz, down the Monterey County coastline, all the way to Cambria, 
and then you go all the way out to the Kern County border. So it kind of looks like an L. Uh, it's pretty diverse, pretty big. Um, but I get to see, uh, experience a way a lot of, um, I guess I'll say counties work with, work with each other inside that county. And I can tell you, um, here in Santa Cruz County, uh, we really have a partnership amongst the government agencies, be it with federal and Capitola, be it with federal and state or supervisorial. We all work together very, very well. I cannot stress that enough. And that's not just, you know, in times of emergency, but in regular uh, issues that come up. There really is a partnership here in Santa Cruz County that I'm proud to be a part of. And, and I gotta, I got to give a lot of credit to uh, Supervisor Zach Frank. Uh, it's unfortunate that he's not running again, but he has done an amazing job representing this area. Uh, I feel very fortunate uh, to serve with them. I hope you feel very fortunate to have him as your supervisor. Uh, but he was uh, very instrumental uh, in this storm as well. So I would just want to give him a shout out and thank him uh, for his service to Capitol and to Santa Cruz County. Um, FEMA Federal Coordinating Officer Andrew Grant uh, is here. And I can tell you, um, you know, FEMA was, uh, like I said, they, they really stepped forward uh, when it came to this emergency. I saw it not just here in Capitola, I saw it up in SLV, and the fact that they immediately set up the, uh, the I think we had two or three uh, disaster recovery centers here in Santa Cruz County, two here, maybe one down in Spreckles, uh, the other part of the district that got hit. Um, and I can tell you, uh, the fact that you're here tonight uh, says a lot about FEMA, and I really appreciate that. I know that um, you know, there, were, there were some difficulties, but I'm glad that you guys were here and actually didn't hesitate. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And, I, and it demonstrates uh, your commitment uh, to continuing to work through some issues. Obviously, I know, because uh, I hear about it, as I heard about it today before coming here, speaking with a constituent up in the hills, um, that sometimes there are uh, certain applications that don't get filled out appropriately. And there are certain words that are used, and you might want to put another word, but that's also why my office is here as well. Uh, Manuel Garcia is somewhere around here. Uh, where is he outside? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's my FEMA guy. Um, you know, I'm sure if you had a problem with him, you probably work with him, but that's something where I want you to know, uh, be it, um, you know, I guess I'll say anything in the future or if there's something wrong with your past application for these previous storms, please know that you can come to our office and, and dealing, we're kind of the bridge to FEMA and back. Uh, so please know, we work very well with FEMA uh, because they have a commitment to making sure that you're made as whole as possible through their resources. So I really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. Great, well thank you very much uh, for being able to come down here. I, I've been to Capitola so many times. Um, you know, FEMA cadre, we can be anywhere for an event if we're called upon as an appointment to a disaster declaration. But I've been very lucky because uh, I'm Californian. And this jewel of a place you call Capitola home, it's, it's been our beach as well for my whole family. We've gone to all the restaurants. We've enjoyed time. I've dragged my stuff from those parking lots where I parked tonight down to the beach uh, and, and left it better than we came there. So it's really, really um, amazing. I know it was tragic in many ways for the event and how it hit and the impact it had, but also to be able to participate in supporting um, the recovery for Capitola. But it's, it's not just, of course, uh, Capitola. It's an extension of the larger community, Santa Cruz. Um, this gentleman next to me, and, and we're always guests of the state, he and I have uh, spent a lot of time together walking the streets here, the streets in Pajaro, in Watsonville, um, up in the San Lorenzo River area, Iron Gulch. We've, we've been to Felton. We've been to all those places as well. I know that you have the emergency manager for uh, Santa Cruz is here tonight. Uh, and we've, we've uh, worked with him extensively and his team to make sure that this entire full community uh, is maximizing whatever the federal government can do on the return for investment that you've made uh, to us uh, as taxpayers and people who insist that that assistance come as fast as it can and as much as it can. One maxim that Regional Administrator Fenton uh, has for me in any event that I take on, and in fact, I've been next to uh, uh, Regional Administrator Fenton when the Congressman has called multiple times. I've, I've been there and he's given me a big elbow and said, get it done, um, is to fully maximize the return on the statutes that we have that we can use, that we can leverage. Sure, there's limitations. Those statutes themselves have limitations. Uh, but what we can do ethically, morally, and within law, we're going to do. And it does take time, but I would tell you that time is sometimes to your advantage because we want to make sure it's done right. 
There's a lot of dollars being moved around. There's a lot of projects. We want to make sure the inspections are done completely. The work is fulfilled completely. So recovery is stronger and more resilient long term. So please be patient with us. We've done things fast too. Uh, we had DRCs up in four days. That's unheard of across the nation to have DRCs, these disaster relief centers, up in four days in Santa Cruz. And a lot of that had to do with the experience of the Santa Cruz emergency managers, and we knew where we were going to go and what we were going to do. On top of all of the state support for everything that do, they do to, uh, to fulfill the mandate when they ask for a declaration. So it's great to be here tonight. Take any questions that I can answer. If I don't have the answer tonight, of course, I'll get back to you. Uh, one comment about what the congressman said regarding his office. Absolutely, if we get uh, any understanding or direction coming from the representative's office, we're going to do what we can. We have teams of people who help you interpret and better understand how the applications or the requests for assistance come through. In fact, in California, we've done a unique thing where we've actually brought a lot of those individuals to help with those direct appeals or the questions around the applications in-house in California, not just a processing center nationally. And that's been a request of the state to do that, to make sure that we answer those questions to the best that we can and the fastest that we can. So it's great to be a part of tonight. Appreciate always coming down to Capitola. Uh, let's recover better together. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as, as many of us know, or at least as we learned right there with FEMA, is the Small Business Administration. Um, and they've uh, definitely been instrumental in uh, ensuring that those who need the assistance, uh, be it individuals uh, who have businesses at their homes or be it individuals that have businesses out in the public, um, you know, get the relief that they needed. And so uh, I really appreciate having SBA Public Information Officer Mary Bradfield here tonight. Well, first of all, Congressman, thank you for having us. I'm going to take a quick poll. How many of you have heard of the U.S. Small Business Administration? Good. Can, can, can we get a picture? <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm not going to bore you with a lot of information. What I am going to talk about is something slightly different, because we do individual assistance. We've heard about the public assistance side. But in a presidential disaster declaration, SBA is an automatic partner with FEMA. And what insurance and other sources, such as FEMA, don't cover, we can offer low interest, affordable loans. And we, our goal is to make it affordable for you. Unlike the bank, we're not here to make a profit. Um, we're here to help you get rebuilt and go from what I call survive to thrive. And most of us do this job because we have already been through it ourselves. And so we, we come to that. Now, what we have done, it specifically for this, uh, well, for these two storms, actually, as the congressman mentioned, a million dollars has been lent just here in Capitola, but $22 million in Santa Cruz County, and $140 million throughout the whole disaster declaration so far. And we still have more in process. So that's just a start. Our aim is to keep not only the individuals and the businesses up and running, but to keep the economy and the tax base going so that you can go to the pizza parlor instead of just spending every dollar you have at the moment at the Home Depot or wherever to get done. Um, and we are here for the long term. We're the long term recovery piece. And we are here with resilience. Um, instructions as well. We have it on our website and I brought some checklists and folders and flyers on how to be better prepared for the future, especially for businesses, how to prepare for your employees. But we're committed to helping you and we've been committed since day one and I, I believe we're sitting where some of you probably came to get assistance from our customer service representatives. And Congressman, you have been amazing to work with, so thank you. Now, I do want to point out a couple of things, because SBA is not done. The physical deadline, or the deadline to apply for physical disaster assistance has since passed. But for those of you who are small business owners, um, you have until January 3rd for the second storm to get your economic injury disaster <coughs> loan submitted. And you have a filing deadline 
of October 16th of for the first storm. And I've even got one, one better, which is if you sustained physical damage due to the second storm, we have given you a grace period until September 16th. So if you miss getting your SBA application in, please do so, because we are still working with you. And um, you don't have to make a decision now to get your application in. You have up to six months to put it on hold if, to see if you need it or want it. And then we have 12 months with 0% interest for it to, to, so you can get on your feet before you have to start making the payments. And we also offer something <coughs> called mitigation loans, which is part of the preparedness information we have so that you truly can. It's, we help you build back stronger by giving you up, or not giving you, <laughs> loaning you up to 20% of your verified losses to get uh, your property rebuilt so you can withstand better in the future. Can you, can you give us those dates again? If that's all right. Sure, not a problem. Just to make sure everybody has it. That's okay. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can read better if that's not it. Okay, for the first storm, the filing deadline for economic injury is October 16th, 2023. So that's coming up. October 16th? Yes. Mm -hmm. And for the second storm, that deadline is January for econ this is for economic injury. Okay? These are for small businesses, private nonprofits, and small agro co ops. That's January 3rd, 2024. Excuse me, what second storm are you speaking about? March. March. Oh, the March. March. I'm sorry. <coughs> Just in case. Yeah, March. 2024. Okay, let me, the first incident period was December 27th to January 31st. The second incident period, because there were two presidential declarations, was February 21st through July 10th. So that's a very long window. Um, and I've got some fact sheets on that in the back as well that will give you better explanation. But again, for the first one, economic injury for small businesses, October 16th. January 3rd for the second incident period. And that's 2024. And you have until September 16th if your business or your home or if you're a renter and your personal property were damaged to get that application in. For, to help you repair it. Um, this year. Mm -hmm. This year, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it gets confusing sometimes. And they've changed, the deadlines have changed a lot, and I believe, <coughs> Congressman, I'm going to be sending some information over to your staff so they can put it on your website as well as on our own. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer. Any deadlines? Yeah, so absolutely. So so SBA deadlines are, so we work so closely together, her deadlines are my deadlines, so there's really no, oh, brilliant. well, for her loan process, for our individual assistance and public assistance, which are the two specific programs, there are deadlines. Um, those have passed. There is an appeal for an extension that can be made, um, and those can be looked at from a case-by-case -case basis. We have received the projects that are specific to the city of Capitola for our public assistance, which is a non-individual, so it's not non-residential or personally based assistance that we will provide. I'm sure we'll talk about some of those, um, but that's generally speaking for any municipalities, the state receives public assistance if there's a declaration, but for the individual assistance that is ended. Um, I will just go back and kind of re-explain. So yes, there were two specific declared uh, winter storm events, okay? <laughs> The first one you're probably more familiar with, it was the one that did most of the damage here in the city of Capitola proper, okay? Uh, and that one actually started on 27 December, um, but they make a decision on the date of the incidents for when the declaration will be and what damages will be covered. And so they made a call for what that first one, and that first one's called 4683, 4683. It's just a nomenclature to capture what that is. The second one, which we amended, which was extended, 4699, or storms that started in March through July, and the reason for that, why it was so long, how, we didn't have a storm that was that long, um, was that there was 300% average snow melt sitting above the mountains, above the central inland valley, 
to include parts of Kern, uh, where the congressman represents, and we made sure... Just to the border. Just to the border. <laughs> just to the border. <laughs> okay, just to the border. <laughs> but it could have topped over to beyond Kern. Um, but that, that snow could have come down and had severe impacts. Luckily, it wasn't as severe as it could have been. But uh, intentionally, the president um, asking from, for assistance, uh, the governor asking for assistance from the president, kept that open long enough to be able to cover the potential damage. So that's why we're talking two storms. It's also a storm along with this threat that remained in California for a long time through the summer. Just by way of explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like I said, Cal, Cal OES um, is pretty much instrumental in the process that I described in regards to getting that uh, federal disaster declaration and ensuring that the governor gets the appropriate information across uh, his or her desk. Uh, as the, it was with Gavin Newsom. So I really appreciate them being here. And I think we have what, e Eli Owen and Bill Simonson? Yeah, I'm here for and Bill stayed behind. I thought I could Great. cover it all today. Exactly, good, so, thanks Eli. Thank you, Congressman. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. My name's Eli Owen. I'm the Assistant Director for Recovery Operations at Cal OES. So uh, within that is the public assistance that was spoken about. So the city of Capitola has the 19 projects, the $3.4 million. My teams go out and conduct in conjunction with Andrew's team and SBA the, what we call damage assessments after the storm has passed. We send the teams out that roll up all these numbers and then we write a very uh, big letter from the governor to the president. My team's fed into that process and, and got uh, the county into uh, the DR 4683. Um, so obviously uh, we've been uh, through several disasters with you all. Uh, I started in 2020, so the fires, they were a big deal, I know, to the, the community and, and the county. Uh, we're going to be with you through it, uh, the entire process. I've got teams that do technical assistance, so they wrap around the public works teams, for example, and they were out at the harbor looking at the different, the wharf and the different pro uh, park projects, for example. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'll answer all the, any questions you have. And uh, if I don't, I'll get you a timely response and I'll give you my work cell phone. So, thanks, Andy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I wanted to have a, a couple of business owners here. I'm not sure if uh, Dominic King is here. That's what I thought. Yeah, I thought I recognized you when I saw you walk in there. Uh, Dominic, please give us, uh, if you could, give us your insights as to the process, how it worked or didn't work for you, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I'm sure they all know you, but just yeah. introduce, yeah, tell us so, uh, the Mai Tai. I, uh, I own Mai Tai Beach down yeah. on the Esplanade. This is also Pat. He's my neighbor. Um, yeah, so obviously the community response was amazing. Uh, the Santa Cruz Foundation really came through. I think they gave us money like maybe a week after the event. Uh, and then obviously there was you know, donations from the community, so we definitely appreciated all of that. In terms of... Um, the funding process from the federal government. I haven't gotten any money from that. I don't know anyone. Did you apply? We did. Right. We got what rejected happened? twice. And what did uh, they say? What happened there? The first time, I think it probably was like a wording thing or something like that. And then the second time, I think they were concerned about our, because they used our tax returns from the previous year to gauge our ability to pay back. Unfortunately, that previous year was during COVID. <clears throat> So, income obviously going to be lower than than should be. So we were denied the second time. I think especially during that process, because I mean, Chuck, Pat, myself, all the owners on that not were so busy, just right. trying to get things up and running again. Literally spending 12, 14 hours a day, making tile, hammering, doing whatever. That the cost. To, to leave, trying to do paperwork. I mean, like, the, the people were helpful that were here, but the cost of leaving, trying to do paperwork, trying to get all this figured out, while trying to get up and running was just a lot. So after the second time, I think I personally got pretty discouraged and sort of more or less gave up. It's nice to know that the deadline hasn't passed, that we are up and running again, so if you kind of read the But, I mean, we'll keep applying, but... I, have you worked, have, and maybe I shouldn't ask this, have yeah. you reached out to my office? Uh, me personally, no. Okay. We, for, not for your application. For, for my application. Okay. We do, if you would like, please yeah. please do. We'd be happy to look into that for you, okay? But yeah, so um, uh, we're very much still in the recovery phase. I know resilience is a big word everyone's used tonight. It's getting harder 
the longer time goes by, I know things are up and running again, but you know, most of our sales down there are like a fraction of what they were last summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're still hanging on, still okay. still pushing through, and not all of us have fully recovered. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing, and please know that um, my office is there to help out. Would your neighbor like to? Would you like to say? Oh, <laughs> uh, well. The process for the SBA loan is is quite frustrating, quite honestly. I mean, I've been I've had my loan kickbacks before. Can you before. introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Patrick Lynn. I own the Bay Bar and Grill. I'm the only one that's still not open, but I'm working on it. Um, it was kicked back four different times for three, and then but the problem is, is that they won't tell you why they're kicking it back, and they only do it via letter. They don't email you, they don't call you and say, hey, you know, your, your, your loan is being returned to you because of some issues. And it'll say, it may be one of these things, bing, 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 say, go back to the recovery center, and they help you fill it out again. But the first two times, the first time it was because I was living in a different place than I filed my taxes in the previous year, so I fixed that, sent it back. The second time it was because my father was living in a different address. And the P.O. box that we get our, our mail at here in Capitola is not where we, there's not the address where we file taxes. And this, every single time it's kicked back, it takes about, I don't know how long it takes from the time that they decide to return your loan to the time it gets to you, but I'm assuming at least a week. And then you have to go through the process again, fill out another 4806C, is that what that is? is that, I think 4506C. 4506C. Uh, with all the, with the, get it signed, do everything like that, submit it, and then it takes weeks for them to review it because you're just right, they don't give you a priority. So then that happens, when that happens three times, we're talking months of time, that at a time when we're not getting paid, when our income is zero and we're draining our, our savings, if we have it and what, and what we have, it's been very, very difficult. And I have been through your office. I have, I, quite honestly, I haven't gotten any resolution from it at all. And I just gave up. I mean, I really give it up. The problem is there's no, I felt, I feel like with the SBA, there's no real advocates there. There's no one to get a hold of. Once it gets past the, 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 the center where, you, where, you, where they help you out, after that, there's no one to call. There's there's no one to call. You can call the the this whatever the SBA number is, but they don't know. They really are 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 not informed well. They can't help you with the questions that you have. So, an advocacy office or an ad, or, or an office of advocacy would be amazing. I've I've went through. I filled I filled out three congressional inquiries, three at, at your office. Uh, with Eduardo, who's for trying to help me. Emmanuel. Yeah. Emmanuel, I'm sorry, Emmanuel, excuse me. Um, and, I, and, I've, and I've received nothing from any of them. The first time I didn't get any response at all. The second one I got a phone call when I was, I was, I was in a position where I couldn't take the call. I didn't have any paperwork. She didn't call me back. And the third one I'm still waiting on a response from. from this is from the SBA? This is from the, my congressional inquiry that I filled out. Uh, he, he, uh, Emmanuel had me fill out another one. I, I have not heard anything from it at all, and I don't know how long ago that was, maybe a month. Okay. And I mean, I, I was shocked when he, when he called me. I thought, oh, man, so, someone's still thinking about this for me. Yeah. But to this day, I haven't had any resolution. There's no advocate to say, hey, this is what is wrong in your application. The tic tac -y little things are just, it's, it's, it's soul crushing at a time when we need help. Understood. Understood. Okay. And that's and, all and, I and, No, and I, I Thank you for my time on saying that because I really need No, and that's, this, like I said, this is why we're having this, yeah. okay? Because we want to hear this, all right? Um, we want to hear how we can get better, and obviously not just in the congressional office, but I'm sure uh, Ms. Bradfield will want something to say as well after me. Sure. But obviously know that, you know, uh, it said Emmanuel takes the information, he forwards it, but I'm glad he followed up and will sure. continue to follow up with you, Ms. Bradfield. You know, I, first of all, thank you for telling us oh, this, right. because these are things that we want to hear and we want to know. Nobody's perfect, and no government entity is perfect. So the more information and feedback, the more we can take back. Um, I do want to just mention that that 4506C is the form that go, we, is required to get the tax transcripts from the IRS. And the IRS, it, it, it's an electronic system. Um, so I'm going to take that back and see 
But if you would, you've already signed the privacy waivers, I'll, et cetera? I'll, I'll okay. You, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I will follow up and find out. First of I'll all, um, I can't guarantee anything except that I'll say Congressman Panetta said. <laughs> but um, I'm a former congressional staffer. I'm used to that. So, but the, um, the thing to remember is a no is not always a no. And it's frustrating. It sometimes is they need more paperwork. And that goes for FEMA too sometimes. Um, and I'll let, but, and you have a, the right to first have a reconsideration and then there is a second reconsideration or appeal and that one is final. So you want to have everything you can pull together. And you have something called a small business development center that will help you with not necessarily just paperwork for disaster, but the kind of paperwork that we require that's required for any business loan, a profit and loss, trying to help you figure out how to get your tax returns in, your updated tax returns, you have another appeal that can help you with how to do that. They can help you with resiliency planning. They can help you with recovery. They can help you with risk planning for the future. And this is free to you. And we also have women's business centers, veterans centers, and you can find out which one is closest to you by going on to the sba.gov. Local assistance, you put in your, your zip code and it will tell you where the closest place is. They will help you with even if you just want to start a business or grow your business, they're there. And this is your tax dollar at work. So please utilize things. Well. Well, Part of people who I understood, sir. The, hold on, we got we got one more person before we open it up, and um, I, I wanted to uh, talk to uh, have Chuck Hammers uh, say a few words based on um, his work on the Esplanade as well as throughout the 19th Congressional District with a uh, you know, successful small business owner and experiencing uh, having to endure through a lot of these uh, extreme uh, weather events, but still always continuing to go forward. So, Chuck, please, we'd love to have your impression of. Uh, What's going on? Sure. You know, for us, it beats in my heart. The, the village store is the heart of our company, and as is the village to all to the entire town here. Um, and our hearts were ripped out in January. And it was devastating to walk through that building, and even worse to walk under the building and look at the damage and all the plumbing, and all the structural, and the things you don't necessarily see. Um, and I. And I want to thank you, Congressman Panetta, for you were one of the first ones down here, and um, and then followed up by Governor Newsom and President Biden. A number of us were under the building the day before um, the President came, and it was four feet deep in seaweed, and seaweed, and we we're in the muck, and trying to figure out if this building's even going to stand up. And to take that day off and have the hope of knowing your government was coming in was really, really helpful. At the same time, you also think FEMA is going to come along and oh, write you all a check and you find out that that's not actually how FEMA works and they, they help with the infrastructure in the town. So um, as a building owner there, I was lucky to have flood insurance, which maybe covered half of the damages. Um, Zelda's had flood insurance, but you know one of the flaws, and I would love for you to take this up, is the limit on what you can buy has been capped for, I don't think, I think 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the amount that I can buy for four restaurants is the same as Zelda's for one restaurant because it goes by the building. And it doesn't go up. At least put an escalator in it with inflation. Building costs are outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> that needs to change. Like, these guys need to be able to buy their own flight insurance if they want it, but they can't get it because there's only so much per building. Um, but that would be that would be our ask. Um, and beyond that, you know, your staff, the, the capital staff, has been unbelievable. Um, trying to rebuild this building has been like building a flying airplane, and it's like 
we, we would see a little crack in, in the stucco, and we'd go, that better come down because it could fall. And then you take it down and you find out, it was a 100-year-old building. It's all rotted. The whole building was rotted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've worked with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Katie and planning, the entire building department, so thank you. I, I know you guys directed that, and, and thank you. They've been unbelievable. So, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we, have, we have a few minutes. Obviously, you know, um, I, I think I'm willing to go past 7. We're supposed to go to 7, and I hope the, the panelists are well, too. Um, but I'm, we're going to open it up now, and I'll, I'll try to manage it by uh, picking people uh, who raised their hand. i got a first one right here. Um, I'm going to set the, uh, the timer at two minutes so that we can get through people, and you'll hear uh, my, my phone ring uh, to let you know that that's kind of it. So if you could, when you speak, please state your name um, before you speak, so just that we have a record of that. Please, ma'am, I'll go to you next. Um, my name is Joanne Nelson. I live in Paradise Park. And um, I, my home was flooded five times on the San Lorenzo River, and FEMA did help me with some of you know, what they could. I still am trying to uh, fix stuff up under my house, um, tons of mud. Um, but I mean, I finally have that all out. They, what my concern, and I've been many times, and you all recognize me, I've been to your office in Santa Cruz so often, he saw me and recognized me. And I, what the gentleman over there was saying, I filled out letters, I, I emailed your office in Washington, D.C., I have uh, sent a letter, I have come to, down to your office here locally, and I never get an answer. And my problem is this. After the 1982 flood, the Army Corps of Engineers came and cleaned out the river. Um, Santa Cruz City cleans up to the city limits, but anything beyond that, which is county on up Felton all the way up, is so overgrown. I can't even see. I live on the bend of the river, and I cannot see across the river because um, following the 1982 flood, there were droughts and willow and cottonwood, and um, there. And what happens? The things, big logs, come down the river, and they are, they're caught in the trees. The trees fall down, and then they shoot up new new um, limbs and roots and everything and so it's like a log jam and uh, I can't seem to get a response from your office at all. At, on, on this issue right here ma'am? Yes. On the river issue? Yes. But you got a response on, on, on regards to other things in regards to FEMA you said? Oh FEMA, yes. Okay. FEMA. Okay. But got for it. my house. All but, right. But, but your question was basically why isn't it getting cleaned out? Is that yeah, your question? Basically, yes. Okay. And we're told that we can't clean it out ourselves because of the, the um, their native plants or and we get all these yeah. stupid. But, but, and I'm sure Manuel has dealt with this, and I'll have him follow up right now. But obviously, it's not, I mean, a, a federal entity when it comes to that. Or the federal government doesn't have any purview over well, that. But I'm sure, hold on, let me finish. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that he has directed you to the supervisor's office. What have you done, Manuel? Uh, yeah, so uh, since the 1980s, uh, environmental regulation has changed significantly uh, since the Reagan administration. And um, I believe that we reached out to um, Fish and Game for the state of California. San Lorenzo River, uh, there's steelhead trout. It's an uh, endangered species. So a lot of the structure, uh, they're actually putting in structure in some creeks, uh, that can't just simply be taken out. And so I have contacted the Office of the Pellerin regarding this. I believe we spoke this in our, in our last conversation, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we did want to see if it was possible to then clear, you know, perhaps above the waterline or other uh, areas that are being overgrown uh, with the county. So yeah, there, there give, were, yeah. Oh, so it's me. it's it's a complex issue. There's a lot of different jurisdictions, right? Um, because of the endangered species that are in the creek, they can't just clear cut, you know, as it was done in the 80s, or or, or take structure out of the river. 
but and, 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 and multiple jurisdictions are going to have to come together to try to mitigate that. And Ms. Nelson, as frustrating of an answer as that is, yeah. I can tell you, yeah. um, that's kind of the reality of it when it comes to dealing with yeah. you know these multiple jurisdictions. But like I said, we may not give you the answer you want, yeah. but at least we'll direct you, like we did, to Assemblywoman Pellerin's office, to Supervisor Friend's office, okay. to ensure that they understand, because they're going to be the ones who are okay. going to have authority. Let's I mean, besides let, my house flooding, let, 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 uh, we got a lot of people here. I, let, I let know. I just wanted to say that 81 homes were flooded Understood. in that immediate area. Understood. Understood. Okay. What um, we're, uh, we're going to, we will continue to follow up with you and continue to direct you and make sure that the other local agencies who do have authority over that creek are okay. uh, respond to you. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Miss Nelson. Thank you, sir. And then I'll go to you next. My name is Bob Chomurthy. I'm from BAPCHA, last name M U R T Y. And this is my neighbor, Dr. Sam uh, Mills. Um, I'm going to take about a minute and I'm going to give her a minute. So okay. on the fourth, 5th of April, I contacted your office regarding female health. And I got some standard answers. In fact, I talked to a person over there um, called Victor. Uh, I don't have the last name. Um, and he gave me some useful advice, but it was more at a personal level. So our road was more than destroyed because of landslides, and it's under the purview of CSA 33, um, which is you know a legal um, structure for collecting taxes and paving roads. Our CSA officers were slightly negligent in not doing the right thing at the right time and did not know that they had to file for federal assistance. Do we have any recourse? Because it was not done on time. Since the storms, there have been additional damage because, you know, cars go on the road. And uh, if part of it was washed out, the rest of it is going to break. So Sam, do you want the next 45 seconds? <laughs> no, so I'll, I'll go for for what recourse do we have when CSA, our CSA leaders drop the ball? Do we have any recourse? When you say CSA, that stands for? County Service Area. Got it. So it's a quasi-legal. Um, so we have, we do have somebody from the county if you would like to. Yeah, why don't we could more. try and connect. My name is Dave Reed. I'm with the Office of Response Recovery Resilience. So I know what county CSAs are. And let's chat maybe afterwards, and I can get your contact information. Fantastic. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Thanks minute. for being here, man. Appreciate it. Good to see you. That was a minute 55. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to this young lady, and then I'll go to you, sir. Okay? Um, first of all, thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate your name, it. Man? My name is Kat, Kat Salahi. Um, I'm with the Santa Cruz Free Guide. We're a burgeoning homeless services nonprofit in the county. And um, within, like, 48 hours of the January storm hitting us, we were contacted by the city to operate a severe weather shelter. And between the city and of Santa Cruz and the county kind of putting together a budget, we were able to operate uh, severe weather shelters from January to March in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville. And I'm just curious to hear more about both like this, you know, the city of Capitola, the, our congressional district and FEMA, what type of funding is there in emergencies for people who do sleep outside because Poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, and so people who sleep in their cars, people who sleep outside are already so much more vulnerable than the average population, and then when something like this hits, it's just, you know, exponential tragedy. So I'm just curious to hear more from all of you. Yeah, and we actually opened up a facility here in Capitola as well. Is Jessica still here? Yeah, at our Jade Street Park Community Center. And so, um, you know, one of the things that the city of Capitola does is apply for funding through CDBG grants and other opportunities that the state and federal at the uh, funds that we access and we can utilize those dollars on. And so we continue to do that. And our council members continue to prioritize that um, annually that we, we apply for these grants so we can continue those services. We offer um, a grant um, to the community. It's on a three-year cycle. And so for nonprofits, you could apply for a local grant here to help fund your, your nonprofit. Um, and we have it all broken up in different categories. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that the Red Cross is here. Yeah. And they're a part of our resiliency <coughs> partnership, both FEMA and SBA. Do you want to give them some guidance as well? Because 
you also work with other nonprofits? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say any shelter that stood up, whether it's a city or a county, everyone's welcome at the shelter. Whether it's a city one, county run, American Red Cross run, or county partners set up, everyone's welcome at the shelter. So even our unhoused population are welcomed at those shelters and they receive food, uh, mental health services, any unmet medical needs, even if they had unmet medical needs previous to the disaster, we help meet them there. So everyone's welcome. Um, you know, we don't give out grants for that, but we support those sheltering operations for as long as needed. So um, just know that we're a resource as well. Yeah, we, uh, we provided assistance directly to people experiencing homelessness, just like people who own a residence, live in a residence. So um, it's in policy. The law says we can do it. Uh, what do we do? We tailor things to what their uh, local, uh, the valuable items that they have. If it's a 10 or it's whatever losses are, we, we tether it. Uh, in some cases, we can provide rental assistance to get them, you know, if they choose, uh, off the streets for a time being. Um, so we just take those in and actively pursue those cases. And in fact, uh, for Santa Cruz and Monterey, both, uh, they were leading areas where we assisted people who were experiencing homelessness. So, thank you. Sir, and then the gentleman in the green shirt. <clears throat> My name is Rick Fister, and I just had a general question. And it deals with uh, the concern about FEMA running out of funds. There's been uh, items in the news lately, with the President Biden uh, inquiring are submitting requests to Congress. I'd like to know what the status of that is. That won't have anything to do with this situation. Um, and what I mean by that is those were additional requests um, by the president, by the administration, uh, to Congress to basically have, uh, based on the numerous na natural disasters uh, from Hawaii to Florida at this point. Now, look, could there be a government shutdown and will that be affected? Yes. Uh, if that's what happens at the end of September. So we've got to be prepared for that. But in regards to certain funds for this uh, type of incident, uh, I don't think you're going to see, you know, FEMA basically say we don't have any more money for it. Okay. Sir? Good evening. I'm Bill Beecher from the Pajaro Valley Historical Association. We've got 163 years of flood information. And we've been going through it consistently. The number one issue is debris in the stream beds. The flood in January in Watsonville was the South Sequoia's Creek debris. You look at your beaches here, that was all debris. You look at all the flooding in the county, debris. Everybody attacks something else. They never clean up the, the stream beds. Uh, fishing game has been uh, intolerant. And they forget that when we have flooding, it takes out the water habitat, but it also takes out ground habitat. And so they don't focus on the ground part of it at all. Their head's in the sand. Clean up the debris, because it's coming again this winter, and you'll have more debris on your beach. That's true. Understood. Thank you for that, Mr. Beecher. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Uh, and then I'll go to this gentleman back here. No, I'm, I'm not. Do you have a question? But not yet. Oh, well, yeah. This gentleman, this gentleman, and I'll go to you next. If that comes. Yeah, I'm Luke Rizzuto, 73-year resident of the county, and I don't. I want to remind you about the CZU fire victims. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been three years now, and only 42 homes have been built. Yeah. 900 people are still out of their homes, and I don't see any board of supervisors in here from Santa Cruz County. So, beware that this could be an uphill battle. I've been fighting for my client for three years. They lost. They lost our file for one year. Took us two years to get permits on a home that was built in 1996, and the state contractor that cleaned up the property screwed the property bad, and it's going to cost her another hundred grand, and they want a hundred grand for screwing it up. So, please don't forget the fire victims. I'm only talking for one person, and Santa Cruz County has wore me out. I'm giving up my contractor's license. I'm not building here anymore. No, thanks. And we, uh, we've met before, haven't you? Yeah, I've been in my office. office. myself and then apologize to you. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time a constituent has, yeah, I was has so yelled at me. No, no, no. I know. No, I, I want to tell you that, that you yeah. are a true statesman. Oh. You, in, in spite of the way I treated you the first time, <laughs> you spent an hour, uh, half an hour with me and was late to your next appointment. So I no, appreciate that. The, the, you have my vote. No, I, I that's <laughs> As, as I always say, you know, good governing is good politics. We do our job, and that's how 
you know, if they want to stay in this job, that's how it should be. Um, Luke, trust me, um, as I told you then, and, and I'll continue to tell you, you know, when I came in to this position and, you know, the redistricting gave me that CZU area, um, I, you know, I, I, that was obviously the previous representative's um, issue with some of these recovery efforts from the CZU. When I started talking, jamming forward my stuff from these storms and then hearing from people like you that you guys hadn't had any recovery from FEMA, like, what the hell is going on? I couldn't believe it. So we immediately, immediately contacted FEMA, and we're going to continue to keep, my staff doesn't like when I say this, you may not like it when I say this, but I'm telling you, and no offense to FEMA <laughs> and SBA, but sometimes when it comes to bureaucracy, um, you got to keep your foot on their throats, and, and you can't let up, and we don't let up. Um, we continue to be a pain in their butt, um, but that's my job. I, one of the toughest things and biggest surprises I can tell you of this position is making bureaucracy work for people. It's very, very difficult. Um, we're lucky that we've had people here who kind of are on the ground and are listening and hearing, because that really is what it's about. Um, and please know that that's an issue that we are going to continue to push forward when it, I, when it comes to the FEMA. Now, obviously, with the county issues, we understand that. Um, we're hearing that, and we're talking to the local supervisor up there now, and there's going to be a new supervisor in there. Um, next year as well. So we're continuing to work with them on that issue. Yeah, I want to point out to you that I've given exactly. out my phone number to about 12 supervisors' meetings, and I have got one phone call from one supervisor. I'm sorry to hear that. And I got a 45-year building experience in this county, and I got a lot of history, and I know where all the skeletons are buried. <laughs> and no one wants to know about it. Okay. But anyway, I do appreciate you. Thank I, you. I have a great respect for your father, too. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Sir in the back, uh, and then this gentleman, and then you, please. My name is Zachary Fernandez. This is my son Joshua. He's oh. a um, a student at CT English. Um, it will be you next. We are, we're together. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Thanks. We're we're here because we FEMA FEMA's <laughs> kind of marginalized us. They've kind of kicked us down the street along with the SBA. So FEMA's denied us seven times and SBA's denied us four times. And we have a major environmental disaster on our hands. The uh, When that massive landslide happened, that came down and went subterranean and came out under our house, out under our driveway, took out four trees and continued on down into SoCal destroying everything in its path. And we are, have been relocated. We are now staying at my wife's family's property on top of Loma Chiquita. And we used to be on, yeah, uh, we used to live in a million dollar house on um, San Jose, SoCal and um, Stetson. And now we're basically chapped. I came here to bring you my file in person. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'd be happy to look at that, I'd be happy to help you out with that. <coughs> I'm sure Pima would as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say, we, we, when we dealt with FEMA, I think we got a lot of misinformation because we have a business as well. And we were told, uh, Zach was told to just, as far as small business uh, uh, loans and whatnot, you're getting a grant here from FEMA. That's what you're applying for. So we only want you to put your income on. Don't put the rest of your wives or anything. So then he ends up, he doesn't qualify for a small business loan, and then FEMA denies his claim. So, so, I mean, it's just been, and then every time you call FEMA, I think this is something, I, you know, that's good to hear. Uh, you get a different representative, and I think you should have the same representative every time you call, because every time you get a different representative, they don't understand they, what's going they're, on. They're less interested than the last one you talked to, so. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we've got to delve into the case, right? Yeah. Um, just exactly. like your office has exactly. to do. No problem doing that. Um, it's not perfect. One of the things I mentioned that we do with the state here, it's somewhat unique, frankly, is that we, we, we actually do uh, the reviews in-house. We bring them into our joint field office. And so you might not get the same person, but it's one of five people who are taking on these active cases. You probably know the case well. That's one answer to it. I was thinking about that for SBA as well in terms of advocacy, um, but we just need to simply unpack and see where you are. If you've received any assistance at all, if not, why? Um, work through these cases. Uh, I've done them myself, personally. Uh, there's some things that are no question 
um, surprises to people who don't realize they can't receive assistance for that reason. We also are stuck with form letters. We've tried to get around form letters, believe me, really emails, calling people, texting, letters are the way it happens. Uh, that's what the lawyers say we have to do. Um, but let's see the case and see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just point out that from the SBA's mission, we're trying to make you that loan. So let's delve into it a little bit more and see what's going on. Um, if you get to talk to the loan officer, and, and you should have a loan officer assigned. Um, and now sometimes they call on a toll-free number, and sometimes they'll email. Get that message, call them back on a toll-free number that's our customer service, ask for that person to make sure you know that it's not a spam call or a scam call. But sometimes they reach out and people think that it's, it's a scam. Um, and they don't respond, and that in and of itself will get them declined after so long. So make sure you do that. And if it's an email, it will be from at sba.gov. And when you t get the either the case manager or the loan officer, make them your new best friend. And that's coming from somebody who has been a loan officer both in the private sector and, the, and for SBA. Because they should be able to walk you through it. And you do have the two appeals or two reconsiderations. Plus, um, sometimes, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to, and that is if you go to your congressman, it raises it up one level and you may get a more experienced loan officer. Maybe you've got one that is less experienced or maybe there is something that can be corrected. But you have to sign a, wa a privacy waiver. We are a lender. And I, I really got to give credit to Andrew and Mary for being here because it, you know, it's, it says a lot about them. Uh, and it does say a lot about SBA and FEMA that they're willing to come back uh, and hear these types of things. So thanks for bringing that up and thank you to both of you. Thank uh, you. Sir, and then you, and then you. Yeah, <clears throat> this is very quick. Your name, uh, sir? And it doesn't relate to anything. Your name? Gene Nowakowski. Thanks, thanks Gene. Uh, I have been dealing with a, a planning department in Santa Cruz County that is unaccountable, <laughs> even to the supervisor. Zach can't help me, he won't. And I'm in my 80s, and one of my solutions is checking out, which I don't want to do, but it's just the particulars of where I, what I've been dealing with, and I don't know where to go with this. And I can go, I can talk with Manuel, but I just need to put this out uh, because it's a matter of life or death for me. Thanks, Chief. Well, Emmanuel will follow up with you. Okay. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, and then you. Carl Forrest, I'm here in Capitola. Um, I've heard resilience used several times as far as building, being used in the context of building things up more uh, stronger, let's put it that way, for another event. I'm more concerned with 50 years from now for my children. Resiliency over, I've seen simulations with six feet of predicted sea level rise. The village won't be here anymore with an event like that with six feet rise. It's just going to be gone. You're not going to be able to rebuild it. And we're spending money rebuilding things in a traditional manner, responding to crises. I'm wondering about the coordination between short term, get the businesses back up, get everybody going, get houses rebuilt, medium term, um, you know, what do we need to do in these events as they occur over five or ten years? And then longer, you know, are we, do we need to, how do we coordinate all this for a planning of, are we going to have, a, a, you know, a migration away from the ocean? Are we going to raise the village? Are we going to start planning that now? Because if we wait for crises to happen, it's just not going to be here. And so I'm just wondering about how the coordination of um, longer term plus short term is being considered. Yeah, um, very well said. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, look, look, obviously, um, when it comes to climate change and the effects of, um, and you know, to be frank, the lack of response that has been. 
Um, it's something that we continue to deal with at the federal level, uh, as we did last year by passing the most uh, largest investment in human history when it comes to reducing our carbon output in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, obviously, there were tax incentives, uncapped tax incentives that were put in there. Um, they actually estimated it was going to be about $800 billion. Now they're looking at over $1 trillion who are going to take advantage, $1 trillion worth being taken advantage of you can seeing how beneficial these tax incentives are. So I think at the federal level you're seeing um, us finally, a lot of past people have talked about it, we actually did something about it. And I have to say with the leadership of this administration to pass that bill that uh, you're seeing a lot of people and a lot of people not just in blue states but in red states take advantage of these incentives to help them pivot to reduce their carbon output. So that's what we can do at the federal level. Now when it comes to planning at the local level, you know, obviously you're going to have to talk to each and different entity. Um, I think you're starting to see that in Capitola, correct me if I'm wrong, with the way they're going to rebuild the wharf, with the way they're looking at rebuilding lift drives, um, and, and sort of, you know, what sort of, uh, I guess, technical construction aspects of it they're looking at. But obviously, you know, you, you bring up an excellent point that with sea level rise, uh, what we're experiencing, it, it, it should be a little bit more coordinated and I completely agree with you going forward. And Carol, we, I'm more than happy to sit down with you to talk to you about more of the specifics that are happening here in Capitola. Our congressman mentioned Cliff Drive, um, you know, and what kind of piling here we're doing for the wharf. Jessica has been with her core staff, um, fortunately and unfortunately, um, been tasked with um, working with Katie Hurley, um in our in our um, oh my God planning you no know, the other department um, community um, department on looking at our climate plan because right now to be honest our climate plan shows that we're meeting all of our goals because of where we our city gets our energy from but the truth is that there's so much more to do. And so I heard the river today, and um, you know, and we have different types of projects happening now that I can I can share with you. I'll be, I'll be not. Okay, sometimes. And also thank you, Congressman. My daughter needed her uh, passport really quickly, and she contacted you, and it came the next day. Thank uh, goodness. Wow. Yay. I got, I got good staff, and we got, unfortunately, real used to dealing with last-minute passports this summer. I had to throw that out. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Carl. Uh, sir, please. Yes, uh, my name is Bill Miller, and I wanted to leverage uh, his question regarding uh, long-term sustainability, climate change, uh, um, anticipating the future uh, in the coastal area, and policy change. And uh, actually, the, the uh, Sustainable Santa Cruz, it's a part of the city government there, and they do have open meetings, I've been to them, and they're dealing with this issue right now, and they're, they're getting research out, finding out what the kind of the predicted flooding areas is, and they had some pretty interesting maps, and what they can do for a predictive policy changes, predictive uh, uh, expectation of what's going to happen so you can still either build, uh, you know, build to resist this, you know, global, uh, the sea level rise and higher weather or retreat. That was another thing. But they're, they're actually making a real big effort. I don't know if Capitola is involved with their, with, with that group because, you know, their, their map starts, uh, stops right at the border and it's not like the water is not going to flood you guys. <laughs> But the, 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 the amount of uh, material you need, the amount of intelligence you need to predict, you know, what is, you know, probabilities and costs in that would be maybe advantageous to leverage what Santa Cruz is doing because they need a lot of data, a lot of science, and then use it for your smaller community. Mm -hmm. um, because, it, you know, you are rebuilding back the, uh, the pier and that, but you know, 20, 30 years down the road, what's happening, and then also on policy on if you're, you know, living right by the coast here, you know, how much would it cost to retain that piece of property that's going through the flood walls or whatever, and just start thinking this stuff ahead of time so it doesn't become an emergency where we pull, everybody has to be pulled in 
but that we can, as you said, build back more resilient, but with some intelligence long term. Okay. So, so that's one resource I saw is that they sustainable. So they know it's a Thank committee you, there in, in government there. Great. Thank you. No, I, I, I think you're right, and I and we do have a lot of work ahead of us, and there's a lot of partnerships that we have, or a lot of people that we need to include in those that dialogue from our business owners to our, who've been there for decades, and um, including them in those conversations as well as what's feasible. I mean, you're sitting in a building that's literally in a flood zone right now, and that's our city hall, our police department, and we are, we're having those very real conversations to, you know, at our council meetings. So um, that's a really, that's really important. Of thank you. Thank you. And I, and I want to, uh, I know Citizens Climate Lobby is here, and they've been very instrumental in, in talking, having these types of conversations, not just with me regularly, but with many members of Congress uh, back in Washington, D.C. And it's not just, it's, it's local groups like that that come back there and put this issue on their radar. Uh, it really helps them thinking, and it helped us. Uh, and I got to give a lot of credit to them. So thank you. And thanks for bringing that up. We appreciate that. Would you mind if I say uh, Yeah. Okay. Please. I just want to remind you that SBA has a program that's called mitigation, up to 20% of a verified loss on an approved loan, that you can then add to your loan to build your own individual property back in a safer, less flood resistant way. We have some some materials back here that will tell you what to do, how to access that. There's also something called ready.gov and flash.org that will give you some good ideas. And I know the Red Cross is shaking their head because they use those too. So I just wanted to give you as individuals some things you could do. There's a lot of talent in this community that could add to that. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, okay, the last two questions, I'm going to go you and then you, if that's okay. Please. Gotcha. Yeah, my name is Tyler Hawes. Uh, I've lived here my whole life. I just come back from university. It's a great feeling to have a whole community around me, right? So good, good, good time to be moving back in. Um, specifically with regards to the district, the redistricting's gotten a lot more coastline in this district, really, all the way through Big Sur. Uh, and then within, there's been storms, there's been fires with CZU with this last winter. There's a lot of coastline facing a lot of erosion. We see it on East and West Cliff. Um, storms coming at it from the water, fires and, and rivers and whatnot coming at it from uh, the mountains and whatnot. I'm curious with regard to a lot of the omnibus kind of bills in the pipeline and whatnot, if there's federal funding uh, potentially coming for seawalls and longer term resiliency uh, beyond just restoration, but specific uh, stretches of you know Big Sur that's been washed out for a while and West Cliff that's still struggling to get off the ground. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you, and I appreciate you coming back to the place you call home. Thank you very much after your college. Um, look, I, I, I think obviously what we're saying is, you know, it's a very diverse coastline that we are so, so fortunate to call home. Uh, and, and let me just tell you, we do live in the most beautiful congressional district. Let's make that clear, okay? Um, but that being said, we also know there are certain responsibilities that all of us have and that I have as a representative from this area. Um, I was proud to be in the 117th Congress when we passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which will, you know, provide millions, billions of dollars towards, uh, you know, building our infrastructure, focusing on those communities that historically never got the type of investment, um, low-income communities especially. Um, and so, I mean, you are seeing that. I mean, look, to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why we got the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project funded from the federal government was because it was a low-income community. Because before, the government wouldn't take that into account. It would actually be used against them in the benefit-cost ratio score that the Army Corps was using. Fact is, we got the IIJA funding, $150 million, plus the, what good work John Lair did and the good work that friend did, the other county and state funding, um, because it was that type of community. So I, I, I think um, you're seeing government slowly change the way it looks at its investments. And I think that the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project is a good thing to do. But I think, you know, obviously when you look at Highway 1 in Big Sur, uh, that, that's sort of a, that's a Caltrans issue. And they're, they've been working very good. I mean, it's amazing. It amazes me how each and every time when they restore that highway, they do it in the timeline that they do. Uh, and they do it in a more secure way. And you've driven down Big Sur. I, I, 
can imagine. And you see some of these areas where they're rebuilt and rebuilt accordingly. So I, I do believe that it's being taken into account and in how you do it. Um, obviously, there's some controversies with armoring and, and how we do that and, and this type of planning that we need to do uh, to whether or not we start uh, you know, having the conversation about retreat as well and that sort of balance that I firmly believe needs to be there and the long-term discussion that needs to be had in regards to what type of investment you want to have in each of our communities. So this is an ongoing, um, ongoing conversation, but I just kind of give you that snippet to let you know that I've seen it just in my short time in Washington, D.C., especially with this administration, the change of thinking about how we invest and where we invest. So I, I do believe that we've provided a foundation upon which we can go forward in regards to your concerns. Great, thank, thank, you. thank you. Last question, and then, um, like I said, I want to thank uh, them, uh, my panelists, for sticking around an extra half hour, and thank you. I'll make, I'll make it really quick. It's, it's a pleasure to uh, speak with you, Congressman Panetta. Thank you for being here. Your Thank you for your service. My name is Drew Mather. I work for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Quick commercial for us. We're a federal agency. We used to be called the Soil Conservation Service. Um, I'm actually here with uh, Lisa Lurie, who's a Resource Conservation District Manager, and we work in the same office together. We have some other representatives from that office. We do soil conservation work, we do natural resource conservation work, and I uh, would love to speak with anyone who's, um, who's interested in doing the kinds of um, questions that you're bringing up about long-term conservation work. So my question is uh, actually um, to uh, basically just be in included in, I'd, I'd love to be included in the discussions about climate change with this area. I live in Watsonville, have worked at Capitola for the last four years and have lived in this area for, um, for quite a while. Um, so yeah, I have some, have some information. Cameron uh, Mc, McDonald here is, uh, we work in the same office. We have uh, some winter preparedness, uh, soil, soil erosion, mm -hmm. and uh, flood and, and fire uh, information. So just okay. wanted to make a quick commercial for that. Thank you again for the time. Outstanding. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you very right. much. <laughs> Tight for homeowners, anyone concerned? Uh, Rich Cassell is here as well. Um, we did almost 300 site visits this last winter, and we have lots of resources like can help you. Lots of people after they experience damage, they don't know who to go to next, what to do, what what agencies can help them, or like what to plant in their yard. So the, the resource conservation districts, we have tons of resources, various publications like this one. Slow it, sink it, spread it. All that's for the community. It's non-regulatory and it's free for you. We're here year-round, so we'd love to communicate more with all of you. We're more going forward. Thank, thank, thank you. Appreciate that. The, yeah. the national and, and NRCS yes, national right. national natural natural resource, natural resource conservation. Uh, I have soil conservation. But you and I were growing about soil. So uh, look, everybody. Let, let, again, let me thank the panelists that were up here and went the extra half hour. I uh, appreciate not just their uh, being here tonight, I appreciate their okay. service to this community. <laughs> and I definitely want to thank FEMA and SBA for being here tonight. That means a lot thank to this community. And thank you, Cal OES. It, 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 demonstrates, it demonstrates their commitment that not only do they show up when the storm hits or soon after, they're staying here. And so I really appreciate that. And I think this is a good opportunity. And please know that that's my uh, the attitude as well. And look forward to continuing to work with you. And thanks to all of you for being here on a Tuesday night after Labor Day weekend um, to be out here. And it shows how um, what type of commitment we have from our, our public and our capital citizen, citizenry uh, here. So thank you very much. Have a good night again. Uh, please, please contact my office when you have a problem with the federal government. I cannot stress that enough. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>